Welcome to the podcast, Judd Burton, all the way from the great state of Texas. Dr. Burton has a degree in anthropology and a PhD in history from Texas Tech University. Go Red Raiders. Focusing on early Christianity and Greco-Roman religions. He's studied topics like the survival of mythology, sacred geography, folk religion, and contemporary alternative religious movements. Judd wrote a book called Interview with the Giant about sacred geography and the Nephilim dossier. Uh, he knows a lot about Mount Hermon, we're going to talk about in this podcast. He's an expert on the ethno-historical notes of the Nephilim. And welcome to the show, Judd. We're so glad to have you here. Happy to, happy to be here. It's great to hear your voice. Just to get it going, what are your thoughts on Bigfoot and Sasquatch? We ask that to every guest right out of the gate. You know, I, I, uh, I sort of came out of the Grover Krantz school, you know, I, I, because of my anthropology background, of course, most of the stuff that I, I've done anthropologically has been, you know, culture, you know, ethno, basically ethnology and archaeology. So I didn't, I, most of my coursework in physical anthropology was, was very basic, uh, but I did have some, some graduate training in physical anthropology. You know, I remember reading a, about Grover Krantz and how, how they sort of gave him the Fox Mulder treatment at Washington State, you know, going out on a limb and, and saying actually that, yeah, they're, they're, they're probably out there. His idea was that they were a, a remnant population of a, a Gigantopithecus uh, from the Pleistocene epoch. And, um, you know, that's as valid a theory uh, as any. My, my, my sense of the matter is that j- just from a an anthropological perspective, uh, there are enough evidences that Bigfoot does exist, you know, in whatever variation you want to talk about. Um, we're talking, it, 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 it's a primate, so it's very intelligent. If it doesn't want to be seen, it's not going to be seen, particularly in very remote regions of the North American continent. Yeah. Yeah, all our guests so far have either had like a supernatural explanation or uh, we our last guest was Dr. Jeff Meldrum, who's got the like, you know, the the tracks and he was very much like why does this uh interdimensional being look like a giant primate you know what i mean so he right it's tough right it's very difficult well i I think that there's room for both i i I think that that's where i am yeah i think that there i think it's very possible that there you know because there are so many accounts about there being these supernatural phenomena that are associated with bigfoot sightings and appearances um i you know i think that there's room for both well, so far, all of our guests have had a, had an opinion about it, which is great because some people, no one said, what, Bigfoot? What are you talking about? You know, so that's great. <laughs> that's awesome because people are, you know, um, doctors and uh, there's this whole there's this whole community of people who not only do they believe, but they've looked into it. And I think for the most part, people don't understand that Bigfoot's, there's a lot of, it's, it's got a lot of fans. Speaking, you're a musician. There's a lot of fans of Bigfoot, right? Sure. So I I wanted to kind of start this off like, can you help us understand what the world looked like in the days of Noah and how much different was that from today? And what kind of creatures are roaming around back then, you think? Sure. I'm of the mind after, you know, chasing this rabbit, going down the rabbit hole for as long as I have. I'm of the mind that the Noahic flood is probably the series of cataclysms that happened uh, at the end of the Pleistocene epoch that involve the, the depopulation of all, all of the, most of the megafauna, you know, the mammoths and mastodons and things like that. You know, you want to talk about climate change, this late Pleistocene, younger Dryas event that, that takes place probably, probably in the 10th, uh, going into the ninth millennium BC. Uh, it, it so reshapes the geography of the planet that you, you do have, in many ways, a, a different world afterwards. I mean, not only do you have uh, extended periods of flash flooding, but you've got all this weird uh, 
solar activity, all these, you know, ma we, we know that there are these mass coronal ejections uh, that broke through our, our Van Allen belts because there are places on the surface of the earth in that strat, that archaeological stratum where the rock is vitrified. I mean, it's completely melted. Yeah, Brian Forster talked a little bit about that. Si sides of the megaliths look like they were burned, right? Yeah, and there were also very similar um, kind of northern lights, ionic disturbances in the atmosphere that show up in the rock art in this, this similar latitude around the world. So, you know, this was an event that clearly happened because it was so significant that it burned itself into the collective cultural memory of the planet. When you consider the the minuscule variations that exist in flood epics around the world, something happened. It forever, I mean, it put us on a 90 degree angle change in terms of our, our culture. But in, in terms of the world that existed just before this event, uh, yeah, we're looking at a different world. You know, we, we can tell that, we can discern that just from the physical evidence that we can garner from the archaeological record. You know, you know, I mentioned the megafauna a moment ago, uh, which included mammoth and mastodon, but you also had short-faced bear and um, saber-toothed cats and dire wolves and, uh, uh, you know, giant sloth and the gigantopithecus that I mentioned at the top of the hour. Um, it was a world of giants. Uh, and a lot of that was possible because of full genetic expression allowed by their ecology and their environment. You know, the oxygen nitrogen ratio in our atmosphere is is drastically different than it was in the distant past. Hmm. So, but e e even back in the Pleistocene epoch, you're looking at, at greater oxygenation in the atmosphere, and so this allowed for these larger creatures, um, you know, this has been replicated in laboratory experiments with fish um, ha having their their water super oxygenated. They can grow to, to two and three times as big as the, the recorded a average. Some people say that, that the Earth used to be like a greenhouse. Is that kind of what you're describing? Yeah. Uh, and again, that's kind of something that, you know, the, the, the Genesis account talks about, you know, how it was, it was very steamy and it came up from the water came up from the ground and some parts of the Pleistocene epoch, it would have been kind of steamy and, and temperate, temperate rainforest kind of, kind of conditions. Do you think all these creatures are fighting against each other at this point? Or are they living in harmony? What are you thinking? Well, I, I, I you, you mean in terms of, of like the possible, like, chimerical creatures that existed you know like uh like mythological the the stories that are left to us in mythology well i mean because so I, I think that those existed too you know I, I you get a lot of insight from not just the biblical narrative but especially all the apocryphal literature that accompanies it um, like the second temple period stuff like enoch and uh jasher and jubilees uh, you know they talk about all kinds of uh, basically genetic genetic experiments that that tinkered with the human genome and came up with all of these, you know, hybrid creatures uh, that were undoubtedly recorded in, in our later mythology. My sense of the matter is that uh, particularly to the closer you get towards this event, this Younger Dryas Cataclysm, Noahic Flood, whatever appellation you want to put on it, the worse things got culturally and socially. Uh, there's a lot of war taking place. Uh, if we're to believe the the commentary that's given by the apocryphal literature on Genesis, uh, then this was also a world of of these extra dimensional entities, these these watcher angels, and their offspring, the Nephilim, these gigantic creatures. Not to mention all of the other chimerical creatures that they had created. It's very clear, especially from Enoch. This was a, you know these were bloodthirsty, particularly the Nephilim. They usurped. Uh, whatever social order existed at the time, they, they consumed all of the resources of, of humanity. Yeah, they were like parasites, I've heard you describe. Yeah, exactly. So they just extracted all the life out of humanity, and there's this, there's this war going on. To, to, you know, sort of drive it home toward the end, even their, their angelic forebears were afraid of them. You know, what does it take to scare an angel? Right. What Wait, it, you you're know? saying the Watchers were afraid of these these giants? Yeah. So, so but they're supposed to be bad, right? The Watchers? They're well, yeah. They and they're supposed, you know, they're 
at the helm of, of all of this, uh, you know, this combination of practical and occult knowledge that they're bestowing upon humanity at this time. So it's like being a kid and you like you, you, you start some chaos and then the chaos grows into a giant forest fire and you have all your friends are sitting there like, oh, my what did we do? Right. Kind of. Thing? Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Wow. Yeah. It's like it's like uh, it's like throwing water on Greek fire. The more water you throw on it, the the more the fire spreads. How does humanity survive in this this world? You know, I, I've tried to get into the mind of what it must have been like. Just wrapping your head around this, the conventional explanation of the pre-flood world, the antediluvian world, is amazing enough. When you plug all of this stuff into it, you know, this is real, you know, Lord of the Rings, Conan the Barbarian, you know, in real time, real space kind of thing. It, it must have been a struggle for people to even survive. And I'm not just talking about putting food on the table because we're the, these were largely hunter gatherers and, you know, farming was, and we can talk about that. Agriculture was just sort of coming into its own at the time, but you know, outside of just trying to put food on the table, if these, these apocryphal accounts are correct, then, then people were oppressed on a daily basis. I mean, it's very clear that they were, they were killed e either in, Probably both. They were probably killed for for ritual and and food purposes. Um, the giants were eating people. They were. So we, yeah, yeah. And do you think some of this has to do with where we get the Greek mythology, and it all sort of lines up with the little G gods and the Titans battling, and and that doing with the Watchers and the and the giants? Is this? Are, we, are they all talking about the same thing? Uh, yeah, they they are. I mean, they, these are. The, these are different accounts of the same event. And I think the Near East is key for understanding this sort of, not only just the Near East, but kind of Central Central Eurasia as well. Because some of the Near Eastern peoples came uh, from that area, uh, like the, the Sumerians were originally from that area. But I think it, it's key um, because this is the area where so much is happening in the transition from prehistory into the the historical era so that you have mechanisms uh in addition to oral tradition um you you have mechanisms like ideograms and then actual written language for recording the legacy of, of all this thing while it's still relatively fresh my buddy uh dr mike heiser does some really great work on the divine council concept uh in the ancient near east and he and i and other biblical scholars are of the mind that that you know, that begins with the, the Mount Hermon material, the Mount Hermon story. This idea of, uh, you know, one generation of gods rebelling against the other. That's very reflective and analogous to what you see happening with the fallen angels in the Genesis account and all the apocryphal stuff is because they're, they're rebel. There's a coup against heaven. They're rebelling against God and the heavenly host. That theme permeates the Mediterranean world and the ancient Near East world and the, the sort of proto-Indo-European uh, Eurasian worlds. And we're, and we're talking about this, the, the Watchers, the Nephilim, and the Giants. Are they all three different things? They are. And, and something I see in, in some literature is a, is a conflation of the Watchers and the Nephilim. And that, yeah. that doesn't make any sense in context. Like if you, if you, if you break the language apart, you break the, the phraseology apart, that doesn't even make any sense to conf conflate them. So if the people who were culturally closest to this are, are putting this in their, into their idioms, but idioms that we can discern, hmm. then it's probably best to go off, off of what, you know, the text and the culture and the context is telling us. And so I think it's a mistake to equate, which I see not infrequently. I think it's a mistake to equate uh, the watchers with the Nephilim. Hmm. Um, hmm. We're talking about two, two separate, separate entities. Judd, you mentioned Mount Hermon. Can you, for people that aren't familiar, can you talk about what happened there and why it's so significant to this? Hey, I worked there. <laughs> uh, did you, we were did joking you? about this oh yeah i worked at a camp called yeah. mount herman in, in college and uh no, no kidding had no idea it was in the santa cruz <laughs> in the santa cruz mountains and now here i am like 20 years later going oh this place is this is supposed to be a creepy place right right mount herman is so significant 
to this story, it's central really. It's it's ground zero for what I call the second phase of the, the Luciferian rebellion. You have the event, the original satanic coup, and then you have later people, later angelic beings that throw in their lot with him. And we get a glimpse of this in Genesis chapter six, you know, where it talks about the sons of God coming down and, and taking wives amongst the daughters of men. Well, that sons of God is repeated four or five times in the Old Testament. Uh, Benach Elohim, and that's clearly an angel. We're, we're talking about a, 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 the reference in Daniel too, probably one of the other the other big places. The apocryphal material not only tells us the the location where this happened, but it tells us the the time of the the. It actually names the biblical patriarch Jared, who we also find in the Old Testament genealogies. That these things came down in the the days of Jared, and it also names for all intents and purposes, the officers of this rebellious cabal of angels. And the summit of Mount Hermon is where they land and decide to do this. So how long are human beings here before these things come down on Mount Hermon? Like, uh, is there like a peaceful era where humans are kind of, there is no, there is no corruption. All these beasts aren't running around. It's kind of, well, you know, again, um, there's plenty of evidence in prehistory to suggest that, you know, humans in, in, you know, hominids or whatever, you know, whatever shape they came in fought against each other. So I, I'm not painting it as this, you know, a utopia. I, I don't want to utopianize. Well, because the, the Garden of Eden sounds utopian. Well, right? the Garden of Eden is, is a separate sort of thing. You know, Eden is described as a, a country, really, which was probably in, in eastern Turkey. You know, we have the location of the headwaters of two of the rivers that are mentioned for sure. The garden is set in the east where the headwaters of these four rivers branch off. And it's this strange place where, where the earthly realm and the celestial realm touch. So if we want to put it into quantum terms, you've got two dimensions that are touching. Because, again, Genesis chapter 2 and 3 talk about, you know, Adam and Eve basically had, and it doesn't say that they're the first people. It just says that for the line that God is creating, he puts them in this garden. So there were other people in the world at the time. Hmm. That's something that I get in a quibble about all the time. I'm sure. Is that, that well, yeah, it's because Adam and Eve weren't the first, clearly weren't the first people. And, and the, the account doesn't say that. What's important about Eden is that, yeah, it is, it, it is utopian because they had, they're, they've, they're given everything they need. They're basically horticulturalists. They can eat from every tree and, and fruit except for tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so Eden, you know, just to summarize, Eden is a separate operation from what's going on in the rest of the world. So if you want to look at that in terms of utopia, but just, just the archaeological record tells us that people have been fighting for, you know, millions of years. So Luke and I grew up in the church. We kind of went through that whole phase and you get to a certain age when you start to realize some of the things fall apart. I think, I don't want to speak too much for you, Luke, but we both have a lot of friends in the progressive Christian space, and they tend to write off, I don't know, a good portion of the Bible. And we're, we're a creatures podcast, so we're trying to make sense of the creatures, and I think ultimately you can't, you can't talk about Bigfoot and these creatures without going back to this antediluvian time. And I've heard you say on several podcasts that you think all cryptids uh, stem from the Nephilim. Is that true, or am I re was I reading too much? No, I wouldn't say that all, um, all of them are are des are descended from the Nephilim. I would I would say that certainly a significant portion of them probably are, but I'm perfectly comfortable with the natural explanation for for many of them. But the reason I use the term quantid uh, is because some of them, you know, particularly the ones that have demonic roots, uh, you're talking you're immediately talking about multiple dimensions. I'm trying to develop a kind of taxonomic framework to approach you know, what, what on the surface would seem, you know, anomalous. And so I, I, that's something that else that's also been on my mind the last couple of years is, is try, while I've been trying to articulate a, a scientific field of giantology, part of that is developing a, a taxonomy, a taxonomic methodology uh, to apply to uh, the, the cataloging of these, these kinds of creatures. Yeah, because I mean, you talk, we talk about Bigfoot a lot, and I spent, I don't know, most of my time researching that topic. That kind of opened my mind to all this stuff. Uh, and then <laughs> we, call it, we call it the gateway drug on our sure. <laughs> on our show. And then you quickly realize you don't know anything. You're like, I don't, I don't know anything. And a lot of people, they, they have this knee-jerk reaction when you start talking about the Bible, 
Christianity. And I, I think it's impossible to l- take a real good look at cryptids and not include the Bible. And yeah. so far, every guest on our show has a, has a faith, and I think it goes back to this stuff. And so I, I, I preface that because a lot of listeners are like, wait, I thought this was a Bigfoot show. Why are you guys talking about the Bible and <laughs> Eden and all this stuff? So, I mean, uh, that's why I was kind of talking about that, just to preface, like, you have to talk about it. You can't yeah. You can't take it away. At least I don't think you're going to have a good understanding if you don't, right? Sure. You know, as I've said before, there's no reason why these two – approaches can't contribute to the addition of knowledge about the world of cryptids. None of us have the complete story here. We're all, Mm -hmm. we've all got different talents and different experiences that we're bringing to the table. First of all, to be uncivil about it doesn't do anybody any good. It's okay to disagree to disagree. At, At the end of the day, what we should be doing is getting each other to think about these things and ask ask increasingly more difficult diagnostic questions. Really, not not just cryptids, any kind of you know any kind of uh, phenomenon or, or anomaly. You know, I think in many ways, I think uh, people like in, in the early days, people like Charles Fort had the right idea. You know, in terms of a. a approaching these things ma- making making some sort of sense to his readership and the rest of the world by that same virtue that's what i'm trying to do I, I i joke with people that i you know i grew up with the bible in one hand and national geographic in the other i, I was always and still am an ardent student of the bible but there's room for a scientific approach as well like i say I read the Bible and I'm reading Genesis and I'm, you know, I'm not only thinking about the religious and spiritual implications and the, the weird, crazy Lord of the Rings stuff that's in Genesis. But a lot of people can't read that part. They can't include that stuff in their read. I mean, I have a lot of friends who deny it exists. Like Jeff Meldrum said that his colleagues form an opinion about Bigfoot without consulting the data. And I think a lot of people do that with theology. They're just like, it's not in there. It's not in the Bible. What are you talking about? And you're like, uh, no, it's all over. <laughs> and we also, at the end of the day, we have to remember that not just historical content, but it's historicity. In other words, the Bible has a, a strong archaeological and historical textual tradition uh, that backs up this historicity. But we also have to remember that despite its congruency with historical narrative, it's a book of theology first, which means that it, it's not going to break off into treatises about detailed movements of the planets or you know genetic science or something like that. But that doesn't mean that there isn't room for all of that in a biblical worldview. It doesn't give you like five chapters on the Nephilim, for example. Is what you're yeah. Saying. It just says Nephilim and keeps going. Right, exactly. We have no idea what that means. <laughs> well, we have to th- we have to link that with with other points of of familiarity in the Old Testament narrative because there were, you know, Nephilim in the post flood worlds particularly as you get to the historical era and the Hebrew culture in particular, became a kind of general word, that part of the ancient Near East, for giant. It's related to the the Aramaic word, in fact, that, that means giant. But, you know, there were later tribes of giants that we actually have very good evidence for their existence as well. The, the Rephaim, the Anakim, the Zamzumim, there were giants that hired themselves out as mercenaries amongst the Philistines like Goliath and his brothers. They still had that that oppressive, almost innate character to conquer and oppress. And so we know that there were a number of giant kings in the Old Testament like Og uh, and his brother Sion. Do you think there's still there could still be some remnant today of those things? People say they see them. And... I think there probably are because these clearly these later tribes were intermarrying. One of the prevailing theory about Neanderthals, who were Homo sapiens, is that they were basically bred out because they were intermarrying, interbreeding with uh, Cro-Magnon. But we still have there are people that still have features that are reminiscent of Neanderthals. There, there are people that probably still carry around tendency towards polydactyly or something like that, because a lot of these giants are described as having, you know, six fingers and six toes. I was going to say, I kind of wanted to go back to the quantids and just get some examples. Um, you talk about the taxonomy and creating just a way to organize and classify these creatures. Can you give us some examples that of quantids? Because we, we kind of... <laughs> Almost like we talk about the Bible brushing over the Nephilim. It's like when I just want—I would love to hear about the way that you divide and subdivide these creatures and some examples of these as you see it. Well, from, that, from your theory, that's a process that's certainly still embryonic. It's still in its right. infancy. But 
the reason I chose quantity is because we're in the quantum age now. I mean, we're multidimensionality is, is much less theoretical than it used to be. Our last guest wrote a book called the quantum Bigfoot. So it's, yeah. you're right on, you're right on pace. <laughs> the idea and the technology would seem, seem like magic. I mean, when you, we get into like something like quantum computing that literally dump, this thing dumps, dumps its question into another dimension to derive information that it can use in this one that it's it's hard to wrap your mind around something like that but that's where we are but the bible catalogs multiple dimensions you know in a number uh, you know it, it talks about the the first heaven and the second heaven and the you know it's clearly arranged and and also the other the other cultures in the ancient near east and and indeed the world are, are arrange their concepts of of different places in terms of dimensions some examples of quantities would be the you know that they're linked to other dimensions initially i put uh for instance in this book that i'm i'm finishing the van helsing way uh, this would include creatures like vampires werewolves you know, all kinds of were creatures certain kinds of, of witchcraft practices could be concerned they could they could be considered quanted in terms of actually in terms of becoming a quanted not necessarily you know, innately being a quanted. But the reason I begin looking at these beings in terms of their extra dimensionality is because, again, this apocryphal literature throws light on the nature of these creatures. Not It's not just the apocryphal literature either. It's the continuity into the New Testament. Uh, in Enoch, for instance, the judgment that's that's handed down to the Nephilim is that their bodies will be destroyed in the flood, but their spirits will continue on. They'll continue to exist. The word that is usually translated as demon in the New Testament, the phraseology that's often used is unclean spirit. And so there's this clear linkage between disembodied spirits of the Nephilim and these unclean spirits. And I'm actually not the first person to to link these monsters for all intents and purposes to the, the pre-flood world. The, there was a guy, a, a clergyman named Montague Summers who wrote several books on the occult, vampirism, witchcraft, even werewolves. And his one book, The Vampire's Kith and Ken, he links the demonic roots of the vampire back to this pre-flood event and the destruction of the Nephilim. Hmm. Uh, so it's very clear that the spirits of the Nephilim are, are the demons of the, the biblical world. And they, you know, they lose none of their appetites for drinking blood, for oppressing people, for using this knowledge that the watchers brought with them, the fallen angels, uh, to their own, you know, their own ends. So I tend to in terms of the, the whole quantity thesis, I tend to deal more with the, the darker, darker creatures. The darker stuff. So they, they can take on a physical shape, but they have to possess an animal or possess a person? Or a body. Is it a body they need? They're always seeking a body. They're all, I mean, that's the thing. They're, they've, they've been stripped of their flesh, and so now they're, you know, now they're seeking embodiment of, of, of some kind. You've seen you've seen this firsthand. I know you've been part of some exorcisms or demon extractions. You right. want to tell maybe a story about about some of that for context? Well, probably the most violent deliverance that I was ever involved in had to do with a, a young man from my hometown. There weren't any sort of uh, vampiric or werewolf uh, manifestations or anything like that. Not yet. But my my two my brother was with me and my best friend was with me. We were all athletes. Okay, I was in martial arts at the time. My brother was a, a weightlifter and in basketball. Our best friend was a officer in the guard. He was also a ranger. So you all were studs. Yeah. We were in a, <laughs> in the prom of our masculinity. This guy that we were helping out, you know, he was tall. He was about six feet tall. But between the three of us, but we could not physically move this kid for about three hours. Is he standing or yeah, sitting? Yeah, standing. No way. He's just frozen. He was he was standing. He was just in place. Are you running into him, or are you like a linebacker? We were trying everything. I mean, short of you know assaulting the kid, <laughs> you know, it only struck me in later years that the reason that you hear about these kinds of things and deliverances about people with immense strength and knowledge of languages that they've not been exposed to or trained in is that these entities have been around for millennia, if not longer. They retain all of that that knowledge and if they can get if they can get into 
matter, usually a human host, then they can utilize that to their ends. I, some of it is mysterious, but other parts of it like that, I, there's a good case for being able to quantify at least that part of it. And this is where the rubber meets the road when you can talk about theology all day long, but if you show up to an exorcism, you're, you're changed forever, right? You're, it's, you realize this stuff is real. Exactly. You don't, you don't go through that and then unsee it, you know. And while I value, you know, everything that I've learned academically and I, I, I value, you know, I mean, that's what I'm called to do is be a scholar. There was this whole other education that I was getting outside of that from the books that I was reading. And, the, you know, as you guys know, it's a lot of self-teaching and autodidaction because you're not going to get this in mainstream curriculum. Or mainstream Christianity. For <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and the, yeah, that's not stuff you're going to get from the pulpit in, in the Sunday school room, for sure. Much to the disservice of the, the church, I think. Yeah, you. I've heard you say understanding the Nephilim is like the Rosetta Stone to biblical interpretation. Right. It, it is. And, you know, um, Steve Quill was the first guy that I ever heard say that the first time I the first time I heard him say that I was like, yeah, maybe. But particularly when I started working on the Mount Hermon Banya stuff and it became, you know, this antiquarian obsession for me. And I eventually wrote my dissertation uh, on the site. I was like, yeah, you know, you, you can't you can hardly throw a stone in the arc of the biblical narrative without it. If not being explicitly there, then it is certainly implicit there. For example, you know, when Jesus goes to Caesarea Philippi, Bonius, at the foot of Mount Hermon, this would seem to be just kind of a, a place to rest because his cousin, John the Baptist, had just been killed. You know, on the surface, it looks like he's just getting his, his people out of, you know, his disciples out of Herod Antipas's jurisdiction. But this region was so associated with that Mount Hermon event, the, those fallen angels, the first generation of the Nephilim, You've got uh, Og's old kingdom, Bashan, directly to the east. It was known as Batania at, at the time. It had been Latinized, Romanized. You've got the, the land of the apostate tribe of Dan to the west. You've got the Gilgal Rephaim, uh, the stone wheel of the, the giants and the Golan just to the south. The gates of hell, right? The yeah. gates of hell are right well, there. Yeah, the well. guy, that, there's a reason that he used that phraseology because that region was known as the gates of hell in the Ugarit, the Phoenician Ugaritic literature. And of course, his his Jewish audience would have been familiar with all of, you know, as he's saying all this stuff, you know, the, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It's just this backdrop that's just pregnant with all kinds of meaning associated with this this Mount Hermon event, this rebellion against God and the creation of the first generation of not only giants, but all of these, you know, chimerical creatures like satyrs and uh, centaurs and lion men, consequently things that show up in Jewish ideation during the Old Testament period. Some of them are even mentioned by name, like the Shedrim uh, are mentioned in Deuteronomy and Leviticus and Jeroboam the first in First Chronicles had a led a cult you know a, one of the kings of israel's led a cult devoted to these these satyr and and they're mentioned in isaiah too and where do they go we just kill them all off are we are we do we know they're evil and that's why we go after them well that that's a great question i moved back to my hometown and and i only reference that because sometimes you don't have to look any farther than your own backyard for the exotic and one of the stories associated with my hometown is the goat man I mean, it's the classical you know greek satyr uh and he was you know there are all kinds of stories about him roaming the countryside south of town the goats is is associated with devil right the occult yeah. right yeah, well yeah certainly it goes all it goes back to Mount Hermon again, you know, Azazel is probably the archetype for that. He was one of these angels that led in this rebellion. Because there is a shrine to the god Pan that the city develops around at the foot of Mount Hermon, it seems more than accidental to me that there isn't some, some kind of linkage. And again, even if you break down the name linguistically, there is that element of the name odds or uds, which means goat. Azazel literally means the goat of God. 
And there were all of these other goat deities in the region. Uh, Amur, uh, that the Amorites were named from, was a, a shepherd deity. Zaka was a, a goat deity in the region. And of course, I've, our, I've made reference to the, the Hebrew Shedim, which were, which were essentially staters. But in, in terms of what happened to these things, did they just com- completely go away? I, I think there's a good chance that they're coming back. Because when I begin to think about how something like a, a goat man would be possible. And there's stories of these things all over the country, but there are a big cluster of them in Texas. Hmm. You know, now genetic sciences uh, allow us to, to make these sort of hybrids. And it's beyond debate that this sort of thing is going on because there have been all these accounts that have been leaked out of these uh, defense labs and, you know, trying to weaponize, weaponize this genetic stuff. Well, the days of Noah, right? Could it be us doing the days of Noah or portals? They're coming back or. I yeah. Don't... I mean, again, it, it's probably a combination of the two. Our first guest talked that he said that people say that there are these portals and giants are behind them. Uh, and it was like our first episode. Uh, and it was just so wild out there, but. Uh, well, uh, you know, I think that there are portals. I think that there are portals. You know, I think that that's how details about the um, the judgment that was handed down against the Watchers. You know, most of them are, are placed in these subterranean prisons, basically Tartarus. But that does that's not to say that the people can't gain access to them. Yo, you think they can the, go down there? There's all these talks of these underground military bases where they fight things down underground. Well, I'm I'm thinking more in terms of of ritual. Like Alistair Crowley, right? Like Crowley did that stuff. Yeah, like the Babylon workings that that, um, uh, Jack Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard did. You know, I mean, the whole reason for that was to open a portal to let the the queen of heaven or the whore of babylon whatever appellation you want to put on her who was a mesopotamian deity you know there's a good case to be made for you know inanna in fact she was referred to in her multiple variations you know uh, ishtar yeah uh, so forth as the queen of heaven there have been people who have argued that particle accelerators and super colliders that we have now like the one in uh, tennessee and, and, the, and the cern uh, operation are, are are geared towards just that their demonic intent yeah whereas a stephen hawking might call that you know don't do this or you're going to rip a, a you're going to create an artificial singularity a, a black hole that's probably just another word for just semantics. A, 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 right? It's semantics. Yeah. It's an extra dimensional yeah. portal, is what you're talking about, and it's the old Jurassic Park thing. You know, you were there, these people are so preoccupied with whether they should, whether they can do something, they get so mad scientist obsessed that they they don't ask the ethical questions, the moral questions about this stuff. Well, well if they should, right? That's yeah, what, it, uh, yeah. Do you think that's that's causing more awareness of these creatures? More and more people are talking about giants. More and more people are talking about. Do you think? I think all of these all of these things that we're talking about combined have contributed to a, a greater awareness of that. I I, I want to go back real quick because I know we haven't we haven't brought this up on the show at all, and we just kind of brushed over this as well. But we talked about vampirism for a second, and. and I think a lot of people's experience with all of this has to be like True Blood or oh yeah whatever that yeah. whatever that tween movie is where he turns into a werewolf. I don't know, I can't Twilight. remember what it's called. Twilight. Yeah, it um, yeah. But I mean that just hasn't come up yet in our show, Nate. And thought I, I would love just you to if that's something you think actually has either a real root or is a real thing. Can you talk about that at all? I do. I, I, I do believe, you know, a, again, we have to understand that, that the vampire at, at its essence is a demonic creature. It's a demonic entity. And we're so conditioned by culture, you know, we have to strip the literary and the cinematic vampire away from that. And that's very difficult to do because, you know, hey, I, I like I like a good vampire novel as much as the next person. <laughs> but, yeah, you know, you have to remember that, that they're not running around dressed in capes, you know, talking like Eastern European noblemen, or they're not, you know, glitterly, t- you know, teen- teenagers like in Twilight. <laughs> uh, and that's another thing that's dangerous too is is when, you know, there's a point where you can take the vampire, make them a, an anti-hero, like sort of like Anne Ross did. Even Anne Ross's vampires though had this kind of self-loathing, you know, about they still knew that there was something really messed up about them. But now. The vampire is a, a sympathetic creature or, or a, an all-out hero. 
I'm from the Van Helsing, you know, Blade the Vampire Hunter school, you know, they need, there's a reason that they're villainous is because they've been villainous in our, our, our history for millennia. See, I have a question about that. I've been thinking about this for like a lot of episodes when I, I, I have some chickens, right? And they're two days, three days old. They're scratching in the dirt. How do they know how to do that? How do, how do they know? Is it because for, you know, hundreds, thousands of years they've been doing this? And do we have some fear in our DNA written? We know these creatures are evil. Like we know giants probably ate us at one point. We can't quite say they existed because they don't run around like they used to. But we know, are we fascinated by them? Do we, you know, like you see a snake, you jump five miles in the air. How do you know to, how do you know to have that fear of that snake? Is it just, is it because we've been afraid of those things for centuries and does the same thing go for vampires and giants? Do we are, do we know where? Can we almost tap in? And th- is it written on our DNA to be afraid of this? Yeah, thing? I think so. I, I I think that's a good point. I I you know, and w- when people are are you know approach me with incredulity about the existence of, of vampires, I'm like, well, you know, you, again, you've got to strip away the literary and the cinematic stuff. You have to remember that that there's there's great variation culturally, you know if you're just talking about the ethnology of a vamp a vampire there's great variation culturally but there is this core you know idea of the vampire and and to just write it off as you know exploded superstition altogether that people aren't having these real experiences again just just from a quantitative perspective if you look at the amount of the material that's been gathered over time and space over many cultures thousands of years clearly people were having you know, even if some of the people were just retelling the story, clearly some of these people were having these very violent, invasive, uh, traumatic experiences. And, and with the same severity as other widespread shared events like the flood, these ideas yeah. burn themselves into our cultural memory so that we still... exactly. We still retain, you know, that healthy fear. Yeah, our fear was burned into our psyche of these giants and these demons and these creatures, werewolves, and because some our ancestors saw this stuff, and we know they saw that stuff, and we or we can feel that they saw that stuff, you know, and we still we're, we obsess and about in it the, today. The still. case with with giants uh, and and, uh, and other creatures too, but I, I'm thinking about giants. It hasn't been that long ago that that they were around. You know, I mean, it's one thing to talk about the the tri- the indigenous tribes of of the Americas, talking about you know that's as recent as four, five, six hundred years ago. But you know, there are cases where we have pictorial evidence. I did a presentation a number of years ago about a, an Egyptian plate that that was chiseled out. Basically, it was a base relief made during the Battle of Kadesh, which uh, 32, 32, 3300 uh, years ago, one of the largest battles in the ancient world, five, 6,000 chariots between the Hittites and the Egyptians, well attested. And you hear in the middle of it, you've got these Egyptian soldiers and they have these, these two captives that they called the Shasu. They're from a tribe called the Shasu or the, the Anak, which is interesting because that's similar to the Anakim. And they're, they're on their knees, but they are clearly taller than their captors. And so you run into stuff like this that, that's odd to begin with because the Egyptians usually depicted themselves as taller than their enemies. So this sort of blows the whole hierarchy of scale thesis out the window. You've got this snapshot, basically, second, late second millennium snapshot of these two giants. 3,000 years, that's, that's nothing. That's a quarter in, in a mile-high stack of quarters in terms of human history. So these things made an imprint, yes, collectively, but some of those imprints were still being seared into our, our culture and our memory uh, very recently. You know, I heard you say this about mythology. You said it's a, it's a very abused word. Because it, it, people think of it as fake or fiction or fairy tale, but I like the way you describe it. You describe mythology as like a preservation. It's a way to preserve stories, to the truth of something that happened, and 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 we tell these stories in a way so they don't they aren't forgotten. But we kind of you know modern day humans, we just like oh that's mythology. That none of that ever happened. 
It's just, and I'm like, why would we keep telling these stories if it wasn't rooted in some right. kind of truth? In Western languages, in particular, we've done that word myth a great disservice. You know, it, it the way we use it now is almost 180 degrees out of phase from its etymology. You know, muthos, the Greek word, means a story, uh, usually with some sort of historical or, or philosophical or religious push to it. But yeah, I mean, mythology is this. It's a functional part of the cultural toolkit, you know, whereas, you know, paleographers and, and epigraphers and historians and people that deal with, with ancient languages for years sort of wrote it off as, you know, yeah, it's important culturally, but it's it's part of their literature. You know, it's basically novels and comic books, basically. See, this is where anthropologists got the gun, you know, they got the jump on the rest of us because they were actually going out and talking to people living in these kind of, in these these preliterate stone age societies in in the modern era people that were still yeah. thinking mythologically they 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 lived in an oral culture all of their bodies of knowledge whether it was philosophy or history or economics or whatever it, mathematics it was all tied together it was not intellectually compartmentalized like we do and and so that sharp line that we draw between today that we draw between mythology and history doesn't exist in that that worldview and it didn't exist in in early antiquity because e even as writing was was kind of coming into its own those people were still thinking mythologically they they weren't they weren't drawing that line between mythology and history that we we draw i feel like we live in the matrix now we live in this very weird box where we've forgotten our own history and we, we, we debate if it even exists. Nothing is spiritual. And I think ancient people, you had to pick a side because you literally had giants running through and picking you up yeah. and eating you. So you had to decide right away. Like, it's not, well, do the giants exist? I'm like, here comes one. Yeah. It's good. <laughs> you know what right. I mean? Run. Um, and that shapes the way you see everything. And I think now we live in this age of uh, agnosticism where nothing, they don't believe in anything. I, I think yeah. you could you could only be an agnostic, what, for the last couple hundred years, right? Because before then, the Native Americans are still battling right. these giants and they have, uh, and they know, yeah. like there's the, the Shawnee were supposedly have killed the last of them, right? And that was the end of right. them. So that was that three or 400 years ago? Yeah, in terms of population in the Americas, you know, the Paiute and the ancient Puebloans fought yeah. them as well. And of all these creatures, uh, what are your what's you, like something? What's the most fascinating one to you? Well, well for me, it, it it always goes back in terms of the the creatures. It always goes back to the giants because so much of of what I'm dealing with right now, um, with looking at these dark creatures, uh, the roots are, are are demonic. They go back to the pre flood world, and so you know whether I'm looking at uh, ritualized cannibal cannibalism or, or vampires or werewolves or, or sort of revenants or, or like the Nosferatu or, or ghouls, you know, in the, the Arabic world, because um, their roots are, are antediluvian uh, and specifically, uh, in my estimation, tied to the Nephilim, not only by virtue of the trail that I'm following, but just my interest. That's where my main interest lies in, in terms of these creatures. Why? Are Christians the most skeptical of this? I, I I had a friend text me and said, "Dude, including the giants in the story is a pagan way to read the Bible." And I'm like, "What? What? I mean, I've had some visceral reactions when I try to get my friends to consider the giants." I I don't know how you can make sense of of, of the Old Testament narrative, particularly the you know if you look at the the conquest era when the when the Israelites go back and and conquer Canaan, there are these these giant tribes are all throughout Canaan and then you ha you have God saying well go destroy the city down to every last man woman and child if you you, d you dig in a little bit deeper you find out th these places were completely infiltrated by these tribes of giants like the Anakim and the Rephaim and the Zamzumim and the Imim there was you know otherwise God just looks like this this genocidal maniac right I mean, yeah genocidal yeah. maniac exactly well people get to a certain age and they walk away from their faith because of that they go I can't believe in this because God's a total yeah. he's a, just a warlord and I'm like no you don't have the characters like come on wake up you know yeah um, it, but they refuse they they'll wrestle for years on the idea that how did how could God command Joshua to do these things? And they'll never consider what he's up against. It's like, like, 
I feel like you could give them a giant skeleton, set it down at their feet, and they'd still go, I don't know, it's fake. Well, you know, when people ask me about evidence, my my first sort of snarky response is, where do you want me to start? Evidence that's hiding in plain sight. And usually when evidence comes into the discussion, people immediately go to the physical evidence, you know, the articulated skeleton that we're all looking for, you know, nicely nestled into the archaeological record or even, a, you know, a living specimen, which is kind of frightening to even contemplate. Our first guest talked about people still some, seeing some of those, but yeah, uh, yeah. Um, and I, I've, uh, through my own context, you know, I, I hear about you know, the occasional living specimen and they're they they clearly in terms of behavior if these are legitimate counts they're in terms of behavior they they're clearly in line with the descriptions that we have of them in particularly the apocryphal literature but also in, in a general way in the old testament but the evidence is that I, there are three kinds of evidence that should be articulated and examined and those are mythological textual or historical and then finally physical evidence and the reason i start with the mythological or oral, oral traditions is that that's the source of evidence that we have that's in most abundance. The fact of the matter remains is that there are plenty of, of cultural examples of societies that have mechanisms built into their culture uh, for maintaining the accuracy. For instance, the Druids I had to study for anywhere from 10 to 20 years before they, they advanced beyond the, the sort of bardic phase of their education, memorizing just thousands upon thousands of these these little three-line axioms that contain the the corpus of their their knowledge hmm. the uh, the Anasazi in the desert southwest had a, a system of uh, transmitting information from generation to generation you know stuff that's that's very complex they could predict you know a celestial event that wouldn't happen for five generations down and by the time that fifth generation got there they knew exactly what they were looking for and where and when in the sky they were going to be seeing this. Even the ancient Hebrews, you know, the Hebrews didn't have a written language until, you know, the 11th, 10th century BC. Before that, you know, for, for nearly a thousand years, they were, they were a, an oral culture. And of course, they had mechanisms for maintaining the accuracy of this information too. Uh, and of course, these mechanisms in Hebrew culture were transmitted even to the, the time after, you know, the Hebrews had a, a written language. You know, they had a system of, of multiple scribes. They're working on basically the same passage, the same portion of, of scripture that they're they're copying or, or transmitting or whatever. And so there's a system of redundancy that's built into their writing culture. It existed long before they were even, you know, a literate culture. Uh, and so there you've got it. You have examples of how accurate information information can be transmitted generation to generation in an oral society. On that token, why then would, would we be so quick to dismiss stories of giants just from a world mythology perspective, much less the perspective of the, the ancient Near East, or let's say the prehistoric Near East? Uh, and once those stories began to, to be written down, then we start to get into not just the venue, but we're, we begin to talk about the second kind of, of evidence, and that's the text evidence. The fact that, that world mythology is replete with stories of, of these creatures, not just that, but the preternatural qualities of these creatures should at least be cause for looking into the matter further. Because you, yeah, just like other elements in mythology, like the flood epic that are, are so prevalent in world mythology with very little variation, these sorts of reoccurrences begin to approach the level of what Carl Jung called the archetype. Uh, I have a different perspective on archetypes altogether. I agree that there are these universal perennial mythological themes, but there's a reason that they're there is because many of them occur in real space and time. And I, I believe that that's the case with the giants. And so, uh, you know, we have this huge body of, of evidence just staring us in the face uh, from mythology that, that generally just gets brushed to the side as, well, if, if it's oral or, or even if it's written, it's interesting and it's novel, but it's still just literature. It's, the, it's trying to give a, a, a supernatural explanation to, to the natural world. Is that because we're so used to, as a culture, reading fiction, watching movies, that we equate anything that's 
sounds strange to be to to be just a story not yes and i I think the precedent for that goes back even further than the industrial age in some respects it goes back to the uh the enlightenment movement of the 18th century uh which basically didn't necessarily start the intellectual compartmentalization that we have but certainly set it on its path you know the the key component whether you're talking about the natural world or politics or history or the sciences or whatever at that time the key element behind it the driving force was empiricism that's why it was called the age of reason is because believe that you could you could reason these things out with you know the best uh, empirical evidence that you had the the enlightenment era really started moving us down that line well fast forward to the 20th and 21st centuries we're bombarded in pop culture with all of these themes from world mythology and world folklore and so and and even in in fantasy the fantasy realm you know whether it's like lord of the rings or or you know narnia or conan the barbarian or whatever those things are still drawing off their their mythology in their structure they're still drawing off of patterns in mythology whether it's the councils of gods or the hero's journey or you know whatever they're still drawing and consequently that's why those movies are so popular is because we're used to telling stories like that as a species that go you know millennia back well that's why i asked you before if if it's in our collective conscience like we uh, we've not seen giants but something in my guts is afraid of them (laughs) you know as you're talking about them i yeah I i have this feeling like man these things it goes back centuries and um, makes it. You're saying that we discount the the oral stories and the written stories, and we are just looking for the physical evidence now. That's where we are. Yeah, unfortunately, I mean, uh, you know, in the history of the North American and or the Americas in general, you know, that's why it's been so easy for so many, you know, conventional scholars to just say to just sweep aside. Was it because of literacy too? You think people just disregard it because they're illiterate? Well, that's what yeah. I'm saying. I mean, the, the you know, but because they're people from the old world came in with this art, literate tradition that it you know for that it existed for thousands of years. And people in the Americas are still largely living with oral tradition. They're, they've still have that mythological mind, if you will. You know, that's why it's been easy to just sweep aside a lot of those stories from this this sort of empirical world views because you know if it wasn't certainly if it wasn't written down then um, how do you verify it right okay yeah like yeah. i said there there are cultures that have these mechanisms built in place to ensure a de- you know the, that that the information they're passing along is accurate they're not just passing on anything is what you're saying. yeah they're not just talking around the fire you know th- this there, there's a process at work here. There's a whole element of their society that's devoted to preservation and transmission of this information. So, like the the philosophical evidence of why am I here is just as human as anything else. And yeah, the, and and obviously now we can just Google whatever we want to read about that. But in the olden days, sit down your elders, ask them what their elders knew and their elders knew and their elders right. knew. Try to make some sense of why are we here, right? right. So these beings, you know, we, 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 we hear about them in story. We have them written down. And what is the physical evidence that we have? Besides what we've talked about on the show is some of the megaliths, the, the giant skeletons that they dug up, um, the mounds in North America. Those are some of the things we've been talking about, which I think we're trying to, to showcase through various guests. Like, hey, look, we got the bones, we got the mounds, we got the newspaper reports. Is there anything outside of that that you that has blown you blown you away as... Yeah, I can talk about about some of the things that I have found particularly compelling, and I, I don't want to retread any ground that's been gone over. You know, the all the reports and things that have come out of like the Bureau of Ethnology from like the the late 1800s and early 1900s. There's there's a good case to be made for physical evidence being recorded in those, and I talk about those to to some extent in my my own books, particularly Interview with the Giant. Right here in Texas, there are actually some really good. There's a site that was excavated by the WPA during the 30s uh, down by Victoria, Texas, which is close to the, the coast. So the WPA, um, under the leadership of an archaeologist from, I want to say he's from Harvard, and in conjunction with the, the Texas Archaeological Research Lab at the University of Texas, did a, an excavation of this Native American mound and um, they recovered specimens that were uh, 
up to eight feet tall. Wow. The, the physical anthropologists that they consulted from the Texas Archaeological Research Lab would never come out and say that they were giants. So far as I know, at least parts of it uh, ended up at the Texas Archaeological Research Lab, though I don't know that they're still there. Yeah, yeah, we've heard that so many times. No, no, and I've I've talked with the um, the curator at the Museum of the Coastal Bend because I wanted to find this report that this fellow had written, and it too is nowhere to be found. Now, I'm not one of those guys that vilifies the Smithsonian as an institution. I think it was certainly infiltrated. I think it, it is infiltrated by people with nefarious agenda, but I also think that in large part, there are good people who are devoted to their sciences uh, at these institutions. It's the same thing with the Texas Archaeological Research Lab. On the other hand, what chain of events had to occur that led to the, you know, convenient misplacement of these reports? And because now we're, we're largely left with the legacy, you know, of, of finds like that. Yeah. And we've heard some weird ones on our show. Like we brought on Travis Roy, who has a account called Giants of Ancient America. And he's got like yeah. over 750 documented newspaper reports. And some of them had like 50 dwarves buried with them. Mm -hmm. and some of them had horns growing out of their skulls. Mm -hmm. And there was one, and the biggest one that we had on record was in Luke's backyard in Franklin, Tennessee. It was 18 feet. Yes, sir. 18 feet tall. So how big? We found it 60 feet down in the in the, in the rock strata when someone was digging a well, mm -hmm. according to the newspaper article. And that stuff's just wild. And here, my thing with all this is, though, is that, yeah, I mean, these things seem to get disappeared one way or another. But the motive behind that is, is always where I struggle, like, I just don't, I don't understand. I still can't completely wrap my head around what narrative is, is being protected or, or why you'd want to rid, rid the record of. of yeah. Well, I think there are a number of reasons for that. One of, you know, one of them is at least married to the kind of intellectual dishonesty that's passed off as intellectual freedom in academia. I was in academia for 20 years. I can tell you right now that academic freedom is now illusory if it ever existed. And secondly, let's just say that, you know, we had hard evidence in hand. You know, we've got that articulated skeleton that we've been looking at. It's in, you know, it's in proper rock stratum. You know, there's this, the Smithsonian has a big press conference. You know, it makes the news all over the world. You know, giants existed. Here's the proof. You know, here's the here's the the literal smoking gun, or you know, they capture one of the ones that's supposed to be you know alive <laughs> today. Uh, Duke would love what, that. Duke would love that actually. <laughs> what what would what would this do? Not only for the scientific community, or I should say, to the scientific community, but what would this do in terms of worldview and philosophy? It would confirm. You know, people would be like, oh, God, there, there really were giants. And the Bible talked about them. So what else? You know, what? oh, my gosh, you know, we, we actually do live in a cosmic battleground, basically. We right. really are living in our version of Star Wars, you know. Think for a minute what that would do. It would, it, it would completely decimate the agenda. Not only would it confirm the biblical, you know, ancient worldview, but it would, it would completely destroy the plans of... You know, whatever appellation you want to give to them, the New World Order, the Illuminati, Luciferians, you know, it's all this, it, it's all this multi-tendrilled hydra, it's all the same thing. And they're, do you think they're behind it? Yeah, but they don't advertise necessarily what they're what they're doing they 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 infiltrate they, they work in small you know little groups yeah i've heard it said that the devil is the devil only works on the person that he's inter the host he, uh, right he's not he's not out advertising what he's doing is his the it's the goal of the supernatural entities is to to infiltrate someone's life but keep it hush hush operate like you don't exist yeah you've got you know the the fallen angelic realm think of them as a as their own black ops organization their own intelligence organization well how did this how did the cia the nsa and you know probably three letter organizations that we'll never hear the names of how do they operate we don't know they've got their <laughs> we don't know they've got well we know that they've got their core group of of specialists you know field men and then you have analysts 
you know, it's a hierarchical compartmentalized sort of organization, but they also have assets that they have out in the field, expendable assets. You know, that's how these people, you know, are working behind the scenes, not only in the sciences or museums or whatever, but in, in mm. all of our, our, our cultural institutions. I think they hide it less so now because it's harder to hide those sorts of things and a whole lot has come to light about their activities but you know it also has to do with the the reason that mainstream science and academia wants to just peripheralize and marginalize this stuff it also has to do with the effects of postmodernism on our our intellectual traditions postmodernism truth is not an objective thing like it used to be sure. under the classical paradigm truth is now relative you can read any hermeneutic into it that you want to. And we're reaping the consequences of that right now in our, our own society. Well, what's true for you may not may not be true for for me or, or whatever. Well, well, even down to just good and evil, right? Like some of my friends don't think evil actually exists. It's just a collective of ego and there are no evil entities in the world. It's a matter of perspective. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, yeah, exactly, and that—that's postmodernism in a nutshell. Is right, that, there's no absolutes anymore. It, there's no—it's all relativism. And that's an epiphenomenon of you know these intellectual movements that began in the 50s and the 60s, uh, and they completely threw out the classical paradigms about the pursuit of truth, goodness, and beauty. And and now we're at a point to where education is no longer really education. It's become re glorified re-education camps. Also, into indoctrination. Yeah, exactly. Into the preferred narrative, exactly. right? I mean, that's, that's really not an indictment of an institution or even the teachers out there, because there are good teachers, but there are also teachers out there who tow the party line. Yeah, we talked to we talked to Jeff Meldrum about this. You know, the he had he he had a hard time getting tenure and becoming a full professor just because he was pursuing evidence for Sasquatch. And yeah. he said his, he literally the, the dean of the college had to get up and give a faculty meeting and say, if you can't harass people for their research, um, like a junior high <laughs> notes being passed around here, but professors at a college. So yeah. we, we've got a firsthand account of that uh, sort of closed minded system where, you know, if you if you do teach and if you do pursue and you do try to go get out of the box you're you're reprimanded by your uh, your colleagues, right? Yeah, yeah. It's as and I, Jed, I was gonna say what what I think, what I hear you saying too. I think is true across the board and in, in all all disciplines is really you just follow the money, right? Yeah, you follow that money, yeah. it'll lead you to exactly to to what is. But then people say you know, this to, is to conspiratorial. The, all you guys are talking about is conspiracy theories now, and then they shut us up and keep going, right? No, I mean, you, we just talked about it though. Like much of what we consider to be scientific research in the classical sense is funded either by a grant or by an entity. And so therefore you, you have to check a certain amount of boxes in order to receive the money to do the research. Yeah. Like it or not, a lot of that research is you're working backwards from, from a, a conclusion. It feel, it feels like instead of, instead of in the classical sense, like like you're talking about Jed, you're, you're out there actually exploring and, and, and attempting to, to discover we're really just, we're looking for something that we think we already know. And we're trying looking for the evidence to back that up, right? And so, if you throw a monkey wrench into that with something that doesn't fit the, you know, that swims upstream against the preferred thought and narrative, then you, then you, then you start. Nate, we've done this a million times. You start talking about, oh, it's a conspiracy theory, right? Which is essentially just CIA propaganda, and it always has been. That's you want to look up Freedom of Information Act. That it's 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 in there. Mm. This is, is a tactic in order to to de to you know to decredit or or to delegitimize thought that doesn't flow in the direction that that the uh you know that the entities prefer and who that entity may be whether it be the government whether it be whoever's pulling the strings at academia whoever holds the purse strings to the endowment mm -hmm. and so on and but so there's on. good cops and bad cops is kind of what yeah. you're saying oh sure absolutely but i, th I think I, what i'm hearing too is that it's it's man it's the usual suspects right it's the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world it didn't exist. Yeah, that's very true. And so it, if you can continue to, you know, to push down, push things and evidence and, and these things to the, to the back burner into that place of conspiratorial thought, then you can, you can, like Nate was saying, you can continue to say, well, maybe there really isn't good and evil. Maybe that, you know, whatever your speak, Oprah says, speak your truth, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever, whatever's true to you. 
and we lo- we lose a foundation of any of anything. I mean, I think where we're sitting right now, you you talked about watching a video on YouTube or you watch a video that's been released. You can have ten different people give you ten different conclusions based on them wanting that to fit their narrative, not anything other than that, and not not anything factual out of it either. They'll look at it and interpret it the way they want, and that they're they feel like they're or they're programmed or their thought their thought process has been programmed for them to interpret it, and that's I feel like we live in a clown world because of that. Like you you don't get you don't have any absolutes, and facts don't even matter. Stats get skewed. You pull out stats from here and there to to cherry pick in order to you know to fall in line or to prove your point your point of view not even your hypothesis it's just it's yeah certainly mad. i mean i mean look at the massive censorship you know that's happened across you know social media platforms well they, yesterday we, they just banned all QAnon from Facebook. yeah i know that, that's my my point exactly i mean now we're all going to believe it harder yeah, and, uh, you know if <laughs> That's exactly it just does yeah. the opposite. It just recruits more people. Exactly. Now we're you know because of things like postmodernism, we're, we're seeing the erosion of our our ability to speak freely and to also spree- to speak civilly. Duke talked. Our first guest talked a little bit about frequencies, and then our last guest talked about frequencies, and I and Duke was saying our first guest that that this the one world order or whatever you want to call it the these these demonic agencies are trying to lower the vibration of humanity because they can control it better and the more our vibrations are in terms of love and a higher state a higher frequency the harder it is for these entities to control the world and he and Ron was talking about quantum physics and vibrations and putting out in the universe what you receive, and it got really out there. And I've I've heard this several times. Do you think some of these entities are trying to get us in race wars and political wars and and divide us to get just just to be so focused on politics to to in this stage of hate? And I I think sometimes I feel like on this show I'm always asking the question like are, are these entities controlling us because it's sometimes you 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 tune in and you feel like the vibrations are low the anger is high the division is clear and i don't feel like that's historically how it's been but maybe i'm wrong i don't know yes i mean i i I think that there is a there's a high degree of manipulation on the part of these i mean they're all there there always has been yeah this isn't a new story right i mean this this always has been yeah I, I can I can name one of the entities that's hard at work in this country right now uh, because it's one that I've done quite a bit of research on in conjunction with my dissertation. Hillary Clinton? On, John, no, yeah. <laughs> 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 well, it, I, I'm not going to mark her off the list either. Um, I'm talking about an entity. I, I'm talking. I'm talking about panic. I'm talking about fear. Mm. And as you know, Azazel. This I I. I I firmly believe that that that's one of the act the entities active in the country right now, not necessarily in in a physical manifestation because he's he's still imprisoned, but in some manner or fashion, his influence is being channeled into this world. And again, you know, it's not nothing new. It always has is it, been. Is it kind of like a drug dealer getting a a burner cell phone in prison kind of thing? He's he's still getting yeah he's still yeah exactly you know and I mean the the burner phone being whatever portals can be uh, accessed to gain you know communication with with this entity. Anyway, your your dissertation was on witchcraft, correct? My master's thesis was on uh, neo pagan witchcraft, okay. but my my dissertation, my PhD dissertation, was on Panaeus, the history of oh, religious okay. history of. Of Panaeus. I might have missed that. I don't know if we we talked about that, but I know we talked about the fact that there's some sightings of goat men and in, in down in South Texas as well. And well, so and, and right, the right, pan thing. right here in West Texas too. You know, um, I, I devoted a whole chapter to a book I wrote on the the folklore of this this area of Texas uh, to the the goat man. A lot of those sightings back in the day were right south of of where I live right now. It's it's interesting on this podcast because I think we call ourselves blurry creatures because all these creatures are in this. You have to kind of describe Narnia, build it out, and the creatures give you credence to the other parts of the story, right? Like Bigfoot is the gateway drug because when you see this 
you're like, what else is it connected to? And then what you're describing is sort of like the, the fundamental laws of how Narnia works, right? And we all, we all sort of live outside of the wardrobe. Mm-hmm. And some people decide to go into the wardrobe and see the real world almost, right? The, yeah. real, the real framework, which the cosmos, the rules of the cosmos, the ancient people knew these rules, right? Right. And we don't? Like, we're blind to them? or Yeah, and, and just like the children who decided to open their eyes and go, go into the wardrobe, once they return, the experiences that they had there forever changed them. Right. And that's how Sas- Sasquatch sightings are. You know, yeah. like people will see a Sasquatch and then their whole life kind of well, you know, I think changes. That you could, I think that you could you could also apply that to supernatural, paranormal experiences of all kinds. You know, it, it, it's not something that you can unsee. You can't take that out of your range of experiences. It's something that has become a formative part of of you. It changes you. And for people that have not had those experiences or refuse to. Uh, or refuse to even consider that those those things are possible. Uh, it's easy to you know peripheralize and marginalize and basically just throw those things on the the dust heap of exploded superstition. Well, I just I, my thing is just I want to give listeners who are afraid of Bible the Bible and the supernatural world like they can handle Bigfoot for some reason, but they can't handle anything else. And I'm just trying to say like look we got it we got to describe narnia and bigfoot's inside narnia right it's right you can't just exactly you can't just go into narnia and just look for bigfoot because you're going to run into other stuff right and exactly then, so that's what that's kind of my if i i just care about those listeners too and i'm trying not to overwhelm them you know so i i yeah i completely understand uh, and agree um now as far as physical evidence you know i'm i'm, I'm not just talking about I mean, the, the go-to physical evidence, of course, is the skeletal remains. But we also need to consider, you know, if, if, if archaeology is to be a facet of this, then we also need to consider the artifactual evidence that's tied to giants. Um, and there are some really interesting and I think compelling pieces of evidence, most notably the so-called Goliath shard that was excavated Tel Es Shafi back in 2008, I think. Now, Tel Es Shafi is the modern name of the city of Gath in the Bible, and this was one of the five major cities of the Philistines. And Goliath had four brothers, right? That's right. That's right. And that's why five stones, right? That's why David picked the the five stones because once he finished with Goliath, he was going to he was going to go after his brothers and presumably, you know, he did. What a badass! Yeah. Yeah. And that it, it's, it's part of the glass shard story. So we we can circle back to that. But the reason that the glass shard is important now, what it is, is basically a piece of pottery that was found in the 11th, 10th century BC stratum. So it's the right time talking the, the early period of the, the United Kingdom history of Israel, you know, when it was still just one country. And it's bas- it's, it's a piece of pottery, a pottery shard that has Goli- the name Goliath scrawled on it. Wow. That's not a smoking gun necessarily, but in my mind, the gun is loaded and cocked at least. Is it a big piece of big piece of pottery? Like, are we talking? You know, it's not that big. It's about that big right there. But there, there have also been found in the same site inscriptions of the name Rop. That's that's where Rephaim comes from, Rapha, mm. so, which Goliath, of course, being a giant, would have been associated with. And you also have these these actual homes at the site of Gath that have been more recently excavated that are larger than usual, you know, domiciles. They weren't made for people who were, you know, five and a half, you know, six feet tall. Yeah. They were made, they, they seem to be made for taller individuals. Yeah. There, there, there's, there's all kinds of like big doors and footprints, yeah. and, footprints well, and, and stone. And the, the, natu- and... the naturalistic explanation of that is that, well, this explains why they thought that giants were here. Well, another interpretation of that could be <laughs> that they built these houses because giants lived there <laughs> <laughs> right yeah i've heard that, that like the place of the skull where jesus supposedly you know golgotha i mean it's called the place of the skull which is place of the yeah not far from there it's like the the valley of the Rephaim and the hebron 
you know, it was a city that was built by giants and, you know, scattered all throughout the Levant, you know, that, that's more of that, that would be sort of geographical textual evidence, you know, for the legacy of the giants in the ancient Levant. It's almost like Christians watched a, a movie, the last 20 minutes of it, and they've interpreted it with very little context of why the ending ended the way it did, right? Like, right. And it's almost like, you know, you watch uh, The Sixth Sense the second time. You go back and you realize he's dead the whole time. It, it's like going back and reading the Bible, including the giants, just including the giants, just thinking. It's almost like, oh, I, 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 when did that happen to you when you couldn't read it the same? Because this happened to me not too long ago. And now it's like I want to go back and reread it all. When did it switch for you? Because... Well, it, it goes back to my first work at uh, at Caesarea Philippi at, at Panaeus. You know, as I was the months and weeks before we left, that's when I ran into all this apocryphal literature about Mount Hermon and the the first generation of Nephilim giants. I I remember even like like that semester I was reading I, I or the semester before I had read just a ton of stuff on mythology on. Uh, I went and read, you know, Edith Hamilton and then uh, Bullfinch. I read Fraser's The Golden Bow, and I read Charles Squire's work on uh, Celtic mythology. You know, just anything I could, I could get my hands on. And I was still thinking about, you know, how does this fit into the biblical worldview? And as I started looking at apocryphal material and and like, okay, not only does that make sense, but I'm going there. I'm, I, I, like, I'm gonna I'm gonna be there. You know, that's, it wasn't just a moment, but it was this process over those months and weeks. You know, that's how I, how it clicked for me. And a lot of people, I'm sure, you you know, you're in this, you're in this world way more than I am. And I'm curious, people probably walk up to you and go, oh, you believe all that heretical material? And they sort of throw heresy at you, just yeah. like, just like the academics throw anti-science at people. Like, oh, you're pseudoscience. You know, they say that to Jeff Meldrum about Bigfoot research. He's like, okay, I guess you win. You know, you win the argument. If you say you're, you, that's heresy. You're a heretic of reading the book of Enoch. How dare you? What do you, what do you do with that? How do you, I mean, cause it's, cause it's corroborating all the stories. How could it be heresy? Yeah. Right. Again, it, it, that comes from, you know, you know, not studying the Bible in, in context, you know, like I, the judgment of the, the Nephilim just before the flood, it tells you everything you need to know about their identity after the flood, that they were demons. They're called unclean spirits in the Second Temple period literature. That is the phrase that's used overwhelmingly to describe demons in the New Testament from the Gospels to Revelation. That's not a happy accident. That is evidence of not, not just the transmission of intellectual history and cultural tradition, but Things that have supernatural things that happen in real space in real time. Well, some of these books were in the Bible, their Bible back then, right? And then they just kind of didn't make the cut later, or the canon of the Bible was was largely established even before 331 when Constantine called in. Uh, this is after Nicaea. Usually, people the, the popular Da Vinci Code ex explanation of the canonization of the Bible is that. You've got all these bishops meeting from the Mediterranean, and they, they excoriate, cut and paste the Bible. That's not really how it happened, because frankly, for the Mediterranean world, the canon of the Bible was already established. The Old Testament, the Septuagint, the Greek translation, had already been set up. That, that was the Tanakh, you know, the Hebrew Bible. The Gospels that had been most widely circulated and the letters that the missionaries were writing, like Paul and and Silas and Timothy and all these guys, Peter, who were who were you know going around spreading the the message of the gospel. The letters that were most frequent circulated were the ones that had become accepted. In fact, Irenaeus, one of the early church fathers, writes about this in a couple of his letters about you know the the material that needs to. This is the most reliable material, and so a lot of that footwork had been done before even the Council of Nicaea, but it's after Nicaea in 331 uh, that Constantine says we need to, now Constantine had his own agenda and people can think whatever they want to about him, but you know, he tells this, this group of bishops that look, uh, we need 50 copies of the Bible and I, I, need, I need you guys to make a decision on it. Well, the decision had basically already been made a century or more before as to what was going to go in. 
the interesting thing about that is that the apocryphal literature like Enoch and Jasher, Jubilees, and the Genesis Apocryphon, and even a lot of the, like the infancy gospels uh, about Jesus and, and stuff like that, they're still, they were teaching material in the first three centuries of the church, obviously, because the church fathers are, are making references to things like, like fallen angels and watchers and, and giants and and how evil they were. And so clearly they believed him because there were these anchor points in the, the, the canon of the Bible that was accepted even before Nicaea. They were still using all of this literature uh, to teach, you know, at least as they, if they weren't equating it with scripture, with canonized scripture, they were, they at least thought it was good for, for teaching material. And it's after the, the fourth century that this stuff becomes more and more, you know, sort of peripheralized and, and considered in some cases her, altogether heretical. It's interesting that the rediscovery of a lot of this material in its, in its Hebrew context, specifically the Essene community at Qumran, uh, occurs in the modern age. And in books like Enoch, it's written, there's phraseology in Enoch that says this book was written for a later generation. Hmm. And it's, re, you know, it's rediscovered. I mean, there were Ethiopic copies of it before, but the Hebrew copies of it came from Qumran and they were discovered in 1947 on the very eve when Israel becomes a, a nation state again. Weird. That's crazy. Yeah. And it's the Dead Sea Scrolls. I mean, they... the irony of our, our, of the fact that, that this, at no point in history have humans had such access to knowledge, such widespread access to knowledge. The flip side of that, if that's the obverse, then the reverse side of that coin is never have there been so many people who didn't avail themselves of that knowledge. Yeah, that's what I keep coming back to with my friends too, that there's this whole camp of people who refuse it. Like there was a joke on Twitter the other day, like what do you call fear of giants? fee phobia And... Uh, <laughs> stupid dad jokes and i was like yeah. i said i think i have a lot of friends who have fifi phobia like they yeah. <laughs> they will <That's, laughs> yeah. that is t-shirt t-shirt and bumper <laughs> sticker material right there yeah it's like a dad jokes twitter <laughs> twitter thing uh-huh. oh, that's going on that's going on your minivan <laughs> nate <laughs> so i had one couple last questions one is how do the giants survive the flood do they build an, their own ark what do they do how do they survive that and two, how big do you think that the originals were? Yeah, because there appear, you know, in the, the post-flood, this happened one of two ways. First of all, there was another, there were, there were other Watcher fallen angel incursions that occurred after the flood, and you have this repeating. The second possibility is that one of Noah's sons married a woman who had Nephilim DNA basically, uh, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you read the when you read the text of the Noahic story. Is that if Noah was pure in his generations, and that that's why he was selected for this, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense that that God would allow contaminated DNA on the ark. That's why I tend to think that there were multiple incursions. And the argument against this that I often hear is that well, you know, the judgment that was handed down, you know, by God in the pre-flood world, you know, to the the, the watchers and the jump, particularly the watchers, why, if, if the, their imprisonment was such a, you know, a harsh uh, penalty uh, and they would never be redeemed, why would other angels, you know, other angels want to do that? Hidden in the question is the answer. First of all, they, they were in a coup, if you want to put it in political terms, against heaven, against the heavenly order, against Yahweh, against God. Every act that they are part of after that might be strategic, but it's based on that sort of desperation that, that they're never going to be redeemed, that they can't go back to what they were. They can't go back to their first estate. So they're going to corrupt, destroy, kill, maim anyone, anything, any institution that they possibly can in the, this thing that God created, you know, in, in all, all of its physicality and, and preternaturality. So that's why I think that there was a second, you know, there like Sodom and Gomorrah kind of thing, right? Uh, however, man, yeah, and I, you know, I mean, heck, the you could probably make an argument for the Tower of Babel, you know, being another one of those instances. But it just seems to me that that's the more logical of the two options is that there were just like in a a, a political coup today, it starts with a, a movement, an ideological movement, and you may not you may not get everybody in the first pop. You know, you'll have 
people that, that join in, in later iterations of it. And I think by that same logic, you know, that's why you have incursions after the flood, and that's how these other tribes of giants emerge. Yeah, I mean, it's like it's like what we got going on the West Coast. There's people starting fires all over the place, right? Right. And, and in the same sense, you've got people starting these fires of giants, and they're spreading. And they're you got one popping up here, you got one popping up there. Um, and then, ironically, you need a, a worldwide flood to put out all the fires. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what? Why did this end? Was it was it the coming and the, of Jesus that ended ended this this incursion, or was it just a? I think this was just a. It happened over a period of time, and then it just stopped happening for whatever reason. There's a strategy that was. Well, it's a it's a couple of things. Uh, I think I, I think the 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 appearance of Jesus events in his life, notably the crucifixion, but also the uh, his visitation of Caesarea Philippi. You know, he's basically right. firing a shot over the bow at the enemy. Even his word choice for the church, the ecclesia, the assembly, that not only harkens back to the Athenian assembly, but the the very assembly of the gods. What he's saying is that you guys have completely screwed the pooch. You've lost your job, and I'm replacing you with my assembly. That was the whole idea behind the church, is is re, is literally reclaiming that title, the sons of God, the Benach Elohim, which James also e- echoes in in. In his, but getting back to why the, why the giants sort of die out, you know, the we talked about Goliath a minute ago. The battle between uh, David and Goliath, which is not, by the way, how Western Asian armies at that time fought. That's more like Achilles and Hector, you know, in, right. in the Iliad. The battle between this fight, this duel between David and Goliath, is a latch, last ditch attempt to try and destroy the bloodline of the Messiah. Hmm. You know, they're all we tried to manipulate it, pollute it, destroy it up to there. You know, here, here's the point where we, we can do that. We can, we can kill it off in one fell swoop. And, uh, you know, that was not successful. Obviously David was a, a direct ancestor, mm. uh, on Jesus's mother's mother's side and his father's side. If, if, if Nazareth was a, you know, Netzer was a branch of the Davidic line, um, his earthly father, but, but specifically his mother, in other words, this, the, we, there's a whole lot of, you know, the seed of the woman stuff from Genesis 3 that you could get into there. But the fact is, is that a, a lot of the steam had sort of been taken out of giant kind at that. And I, I wrote a paper on uh, the giant diaspora that, uh, that took place at that point. And a lot of them went west. They went to lands where they could, they could, they felt that they could manipulate people again. And, and so they took the, the religion of the watchers and the giants and this bloodthirsty hmm. cult. They tried to oppress people in uh, the Americas. Right. So you see the blood sacrifices of the Aztecs and those Mayans and all that stuff. Even the, yeah. the mother of civilization in Mesoamerica, the Olmec, you know, they practice uh, ritual sacrifice. And there's a lot of megaliths out there too. That's the other thing too. So that, I think it lends that the credence to that, to that theory. Yeah, I mean, wh- whether by, you know, I think a lot of the architecture, the megalithic architecture of the ancient world begins with this knowledge that the watchers, you know, hand down to humans because it's, you know, it's at that point that you start to see the big, more complex megalithic structures. Places like Gobekli Tepe in, in eastern Turkey and uh, even Natufian era Jericho from the 10th, 10th millennium BC, Tel Caramel and uh, in Syria, uh, you know, there's a, a laundry list of them. Wherever you see the the presence of giants and, and watchers, you tend to see this kind of architecture, and that's certainly the case in the, in the New World. And and how big are they? The originals, like there's there's you know there's twenty footers in America. They say like skeletons. Uh, well, well, are you are you are you asking about the pre-flood or post-flood? Oh, man, I guess I guess both. 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 Yeah, we're both. Well, the the problem with the with getting a sense of the pre-flood giants is that the Enoch says that there are 3000 L's. Well, the, the debate continues about how large an L is, you know, just given the fact that the oxygenation of the, the environment at that time was more, you have to consider the possibility that fuller genetic expression was a likelihood, you know? And so they probably did exceed, you know, the, the sort of 20 foot, you know, 18, 20 foot barrier, you know, that we think of in, in terms of post-flood giants. But it, as far as post-flood, 
you know, it's, it's clear, clearly that probably because of, you know, the changes in our, our ecology and the ox oxygenation of the environment, it's why we don't have a lot of megafauna around too, is because you can't have that. And so the giants became, you know, progressively smaller. You know, you start seeing the 15 foot, 13 foot, nine foot, and eight foot, seven so foot So it's possible giants. they were, they were 50, 60 foot tall. Big, big, yeah, big boys. Yeah, it, it's entirely possible that, I mean, they could have been 100 feet tall for all we know. I mean, it, it's just crazy. You know, I mean, it, it says it, in numbers, it, they said they look like grasshoppers. So that could be pretty accurate. Yeah. Those are historical giants. You know, <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> if you got some, even if you got a guy that's, you know, let's say 18 or 20 feet tall, I mean, you're, that's a big, that's, that's a, a big, big boy. That's, that's, that's a big dude. And you're, well, that's a big guy for him over here in America. So that means, you know, yeah. it, the, he, Judd Nate always wants him to be like 50 <laughs> just 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 for for transparency he always wants 50 he wants big 50 foot tall red hair well the red so hair the red hair goes the, back to my ancestors red hair okay <laughs> well is there a, 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 or is there a polydactyly in your family who knows yeah how many fingers do you have <laughs> <laughs> are you hiding are you hiding a six toe on one of your oh no your way feet? I'm a, okay. I'm, I'm a sensitive giant. I, I do. I <laughs> the San Francisco Giants were my favorite baseball team since I was a kid. Oh, so now we're full circle. Who, yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Wait till all these Star Wars fans, when the days of Noah return, and those nerds realize Tatooine creatures have come back to claim the world, and they are in a Star War. They have no idea what's coming. How are the days of Noah uh, upon us again? As are these creatures coming back? I'm not. I've never been a date setter. You know, in terms of of biblical prophecy, but it seems like we're on the on the precipice of it. You know, we're on the on the threshold of it. I I, I think if anything, we're we're in the birth pangs or or Jake, the time of Jacob's trouble. So we're getting we're getting close. For you know, it's it's beyond debate that we've cooked up these hybrid creatures. You know, in our own laboratories, usually under under defense contracts. But this is different than the days of Noah, right? This is this is uh, more human experiments, not celestial or supernatural experiments. Well, we're talking about semantics again, right? Uh, you know, right. is it technology or magic? Yes, the answer is yes. Yeah. It's both. Clearly, yeah. the the Genesis six, the the Watcher experiment was a a, a drastic manipulation of the human genome. Uh, to produce not just the giants, but these other chimerical hybrid creatures. Like Pegasus and unicorns and flying wild centaurs. And, you know, are the dinosaurs else. a part of that? Um, I've heard it argued that they are. Uh, it's a little bit out of my wheelhouse because I'm not. I love, I love your wheelhouse. It's a big wheelhouse. <laughs> I love it. You got a lot I, of. A lot well, of... thank you. <laughs> it makes sense that the. The evidence of violence between the, those creatures and the violence of their hunts is is in the the paleontological record, and so it's it's a distinct possibility that that the carnivorous dinosaurs like Allosaurus and Tyrannosaurus and Velociraptor uh, were were offshoots of, of this experimentation. You know, it does say that. You know, uh, I'm trying to think of the the phraseology that's used in Enoch, but but birds and reptiles and all manner of animals were corrupted that makes sense right and they, i mean i saw something this week talking about how the scientists are saying that they believe a lot of these dinosaurs including a couple you just talked about had feathers now that doesn't sound like a hybrid creature i don't know what it is because it seemed like the carnivorous ones would sound like a, like a lizard bird hybrid right mm -hmm. or they push it into into the darwinian theory section talking about evolution that seems more far fetched than thinking that there was some, you know, some nefarious experiments going on in mixing these types of creatures. Yeah, and I, I think that that you know that those kinds of experiments in the pre flood world probably contribute a lot to the the sort of processual evolution of certain species uh, that that lead to theories about you know dinosaurs are still around they just changed into birds you know they just evolved into birds. If you're looking at speciation through the lens of the of the biblical worldview and and in fact the the ancient worldview that doesn't make a whole lot of sense you know and besides uniform processual evolution is just it's sort of been blown out of the water uh, anyway and i certainly i don't want to get bogged down in a discussion about evolution but it you know it depends on microevolution or or adaptation 
is perfectly scientific and sound. We see that you can see that in you know two or three generations, but the the big sort of huge uh, punctuated equilibrium you know kind of jumps the macro evolution to my mind scientifically has never held much water. I mean, the the more we discover on this show the more we paint the picture of the antediluvian world. And that's why we brought you on this episode because we want to get a clear picture. It sounds like Jurassic Park meets Dr. Jekyll meets Star Wars. Uh, you had maybe foot-long cockroaches running around the floor, 50-foot giants, crazy creatures of all kinds. And in order to really give you an idea of we, maybe what Bigfoot came from and all these creatures that we still see today, we kind of needed to shape this world. And a lot of the way to do that is go and look in the Bible. And I think a lot of people tune out when you talk about the Bible. But we appreciate you, Dr. Judd, coming on and painting the antediluvian world for us, giving us a real look into that. Yeah, how can our listeners find you? Uh, this will come out. And then uh, I, I really want to have you back for like a Halloween show. Cause I'm sure <laughs> yeah, real... That was a good idea, <laughs> Nick, actually. But yeah, uh, people, can, people can get a hold of me at burtonbeyond.com can check me out at uh, the Institute of Biblical Anthropology at tioba.org. Uh, email is Professor Burton at yahoo.com. I'm on Twitter. Uh, I've got a, a YouTube channel where you can get into all this kind of craziness with me on a more personal yeah. level. I appreciate it. I love it. Yeah. I mean, I you've opened us up to so much of this, and I think the Giants are a big part of, uh, of a- asking yourself, like, what is Bigfoot? Um, does it go back to these titans that roamed around and yeah and i'm sure i'm sure i'm gonna say this right now i'm glad i live now I said it back then because it sounds like <laughs> well yeah it, it, it's not a it's fun definitely time. An inter- it's an interesting time to be alive yeah for sure and you know giants are perennial we're talking about about the biblical world and the ancient near east but they're a perennial feature in world mythology chad i appreciate it I don't know. I just love it when it just feels like a natural conversation sitting around the bonfire talking about this stuff. So we really... Yeah, absolutely. We'll have, you, we'll have to have you back on again. And um, thanks for giving us an insight into the ancient world. My, pl- my pleasure. Be happy thanks to. Thanks so much, Judd. Yeah. Absolutely. You too. You guys take care. You too. You too.